morning, everyone. Good morning. I was just enjoying Highland Cathedral too much. That's uh, a very, very warm welcome then um, to worship um, this morning. Brothers and sisters, equal in the eyes of God, gather here together in this time and space where all are equal. Take your seat. Whether you are in your Sunday best or dressed down for the weekend, or still in your night clothes at home perhaps, know that your presence brings delight. Come as we worship together, and let us join together in worship as we sing our first hymn from CH4 132, the Immortal, Invisible, God Only Minds. <laughs> We have failed you in so much, repeatedly ignoring your will and breaking your commandments. Yet despite our betrayal, you not only forgive, but also put our mistakes behind us. However often we go astray, however great our faults, and however feeble the love we show in return, you are always willing to forgive and move on. Teach us the secret of such love. Touch our hearts, 
with your goodness and so may we learn to let go of past hurts and build instead for the future. May we be agents of your healing, redeeming and renewing grace. To the glory of your name. Amen. is from James chapter 2, using verses 1 to 17. James chapter 2. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself. You are doing right, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, 
Go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. But does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Mary. I gave Alison a, a copy of the, the sermon um, to have a look over, um, as we usually do. Um, and after she had read it, um, unfortunately, Bella got a hold of it um, and ate part of it. Now, this, this is not me saying, I'm sorry, the dog ate my homework. <laughs> But it is just to say that um, today's sermon has been approved by the Minister and uh, passed uh, as suitable by the man's dog. <laughs> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. His name is Tim. He has wild hair, wears a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans and no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for the entire four years of college. He's brilliant, kind of profound and very, very bright. He became a Christian while attending college. Across the street from the campus was a well-dressed, very conservative church. They want to develop a ministry to the students, but are not sure how to go about it. One day, Tim decides to go there. He walks in with his usual attire. The service has already started, and so Tim starts down the aisle, looking for a seat. By now, people are really looking a bit uncomfortable, but no one says anything. Tim gets closer and closer to the pulpit, and when he realises there are no seats, he just squats down on the carpet. People are now really uptight, and the tension in the air is thick. About this time, the minister realises that from way at the back of the church, an elder is slowly making his way towards Tim. The elder is in his 80s, the silver grey hair and a three-piece suit. A godly man, very elegant, very dignified, very courtly. He walks with a cane, and as he starts walking towards this boy, everyone is saying to themselves that you can't blame him for what he's going to do. How can you expect a man of his age, of his background, to understand some college kid on the floor? It takes a long time for the man to reach the boy. The church is utterly silent, except for the clicking of the man's cane. All eyes are focused on him. He can't even hear anyone breathing. The minister can't preach the sermon until the elder does what he has to do. And now, they see this elderly man drop his cane on the floor, and with great difficulty, he lowers himself and sits down next to Tim to worship with him, so that he won't be alone. Everyone chokes up with emotion. When the minister gains control, he says, What I am about to preach, you will never remember. What you have just seen, you will never forget. A lovely story eh, and a great sermon illustration but I wonder how it would play out if Tim turned up to this church on a Sunday morning. How would he feel? How would he find us? And more importantly, how would we view Tim? At least one thing is certain, um, that you would be able to find a seat without too much bother. <laughs> so he wouldn't have to go searching or be faced with the indignity of having to squat down on the floor at the front of the church. So he's comfortable. He's sitting in the body of the kirk. 
But remember that he's arrived after the service has started, so no one to greet him at the door, meaning that he's in the midst of a group of strangers. How many of us, I wonder, would get up and go and sit beside him so that he wasn't worshipping alone? I would love to say that yes, I would, but realistically, I'm not sure that I would. I'm more likely to go and speak to him at the end of the service, and I'm sure that there would be no shortage of people doing that as well. Today's text, which Marion read, is entitled Favouritism for Forbidden. And that's a hard one, because we all know that we shouldn't have favourites or give someone more than someone else. But sometimes it's hard, isn't it? I know that in BD training, I always say that we can't show favouritism to any child or young person. But in reality, that can be difficult, especially when you've got someone who's easy to get along with, always joins in, does what they're told, and you put them together with that kid who is the bane of your life. Always pushing the boundaries, always at the centre of something when it kicks off. The one whose behaviour you have to pick up on more than one occasion during the evening. The example I use then fits with today's theme. I can remember being a fairly new officer in my BB company. I had a great group of young people who worked well as a team, were attentive and had a great deal of fun. There was, however, one boy in the group who played up and you knew that if something kicked off, that even if he wasn't in the midst of it, he'd been instrumental in inflaming the situation. He came from a good family and was always there, even sometimes when his peers were absent. My advice to new leaders is to work with that person, get alongside them and help shape them, because you never know eh, what that person is going to turn out like in later life. That same person I was speaking of was at church every Sunday morning with his long, greasy hair, ripped jeans, and the verging on inappropriate t-shirts, eh, which got a number of mumblings from some of the congregation. And some of the congregation actually challenged his dad and said, eh, can you not do something about him? His dad's reply was great when he said, well, he's here every Sunday morning, where's your son? <laughs> and for me, hard though it was sometimes, I heeded my own advice and worked with that young person. And I'm delighted to say that I can now call him a good friend. And he is a good friend, not just to me, but to a number of other people, given that he's now a Church of Scotland minister. By showing favouritism to one person, you're judging them. But what is your criteria for that judgement? Their clothes? Their accent? Their job? Their possessions? All these may distinguish whether someone is rich or poor, but who are we to judge other people? Looking back through scripture, it's safe to say that God's, God tends to favour the poor and makes them rich, rich in faith and having the ability to be heirs to God's kingdom. We are all equal in God's sight. It is man that has created that inequality in the world. The level of financial inequality in the world is staggering. In 2022, a Credit Suisse report stated that 47.8% of global household wealth is, the hand, is in the hands of just 1.2% of the world's population. Reading this, we may think that we are poor in comparison. 
But as we read in Proverbs chapter 22, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. James claims um, that faith without works is good for nothing because faith by itself cannot save us. And it seems strange that Paul taught salvation is by faith alone and not by works. James, however, isn't saying that we are saved solely by what we do. We are saved by faith verified by our actions. What type of action is able to verify our faith though? It isn't religiously turning up at church every Sunday morning. You will do well though, keeping the royal law found in scripture. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. We are called to look out for each other, whoever they are and wherever they're from. It's no good telling people to go in peace, keep warm and eat well if they've got no food or shelter. If someone is hungry, they need food. If they're cold, they need warm clothes and a warm home. We need to share what we have and to share it now. Enough for today. That church that we started with this morning wanted to develop a ministry to students. It had faith, but it lacked the action to back it up with the exception of that old elder, who despite struggling mobility-wise, put his faith into action by being a neighbour to Tim and ensuring he didn't need to worship alone. Be careful how you live out your life. Let your faith shine out through your actions and remember, you might be the only Bible that some people will ever read. Let's pray. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. As we think about watching out for our neighbours, let's continue our worship with, uh, with hymns from CH4, 544 when I needed a neighbour.
Now is our time for giving. We close our service uh, today with uh, uh, hymn 685 from CH4, For Not Everyone Born a Place at the Table. <clears throat>
Spirit, and may they all be with us this day and forevermore. 